have uh, a guest, um, Greg Asner, who is a graduate student of Carol Westman Fellow Series, and uh, came. He came to see you as an assistant professor for a brief period of time, geological sciences. Now is a staff scientist at Carnegie Institution for Science, and also has an adjunct appointment at Stanford. His interest is ecosystems, and particularly land use, climate change, and he uses tools uh, that involve remote sensing and computing uh, to work at the global scale. He, uh, he also won early presidential award, didn't you? So there's, there's our future going forward. Uh, and he has been honored in a number of ways, uh, a NASA Early Career Award, and he has, some of his work was listed in Science Magazine in their breakthrough issue. Greg? I just put my coat back on because I got in from Lima very late last night, fell asleep, woke up late, and ran here. I was glad to have a, an hour to kind of cool down. Thank you. Thanks for the invitation. I want to especially thank uh, Carol Westman, who got me here. Um, this is one of those moments when it's like going home, obviously, because as you indicated, I do have all of my degrees from Colorado. And in a lot of ways, I think that the most important experience I had was being a graduate student in Carroll's lab in series, in CSIS at the, at the time in series. Um, what I want to talk about, I, I wasn't exactly sure what you'd like me to cover. So I wanted to give some overview of what we're doing at Carnegie Institution and how that is an expression of what I learned here at Ceres. I was, uh, had to remind myself how you guys think of yourselves because all, each of our institutions does that actively all the time and, and tries to tune it and improve it over time. Um, and I, I circled this in the lower right side, the, the, the expression of how you say your mission and vision is shockingly and wonderfully similar to how we have tried to build ourselves up at the Carnegie Institution. I work uh, in one of the six departments at Carnegie. We're based in Washington, D.C. I'm in the youngest department that was founded when I arrived, really. My boss is Chris Field, the, uh, among other duties. He's the head of the co-lead for uh, Working Group 2 for IPCC. And at Carnegie, we have a very, like you, and like what we just saw Dave speak about, we have a very strong tradition of focusing on observations and the critical role that they play in producing new science. And more recently, as we all agree, in supporting policy development and decision making. These are some examples of Carnegie scientists on the left. That's Edwin Hubble, spent 35 years as a Carnegie scientist. Uh, in the middle, Charles Richter, the Richter scale. And uh, Barbara McClintock, whose work in her heredity and genetics won her the Nobel Prize. Those are expressions at different scales of scientists at the Carnegie Institution who really put their entire lives into trying to uh, use observations to advance the science. Um, like I said, I'm in the youngest department at Carnegie called Global Ecology, which is a bit of an experiment, really, and uh, as, as not totally a teaching department, we're a research department, it automatically puts us in the, in the category of tree huggers, often, I, I notice in the press. Uh, in my, in, and that's hard to work with at times. In my uh, world, which everything I'm about to show you is down to about, I heard you have 650 employees, I have 10. So we're going to take ourselves down in scale, but think big thoughts and show you what we're doing. And, and my point of this is to show you what we're doing, but clearly and, and directly with the, with the idea that pretty much the way I learned to do this happened at Ceres. Uh, my focus is expressed in these uh, modeling simulations of novel climates and disappearing climates that came out by Williams et al. and PNAS about five years ago. And the reds show areas of concern where the climate system is changing relative to the biota. And I heard a, a, a comment earlier, a joke about how the biologists have the short, maybe the smallest division or the smallest uh, role in this. This is an expression of where the biology might be in terms of plant biology might be the most ill-prepared for the kind of climate changes that we are now undergoing, at least compared to post or late Holocene uh, conditions. And what you're going to see is that the Amazon basin, you see in the lower part, uh, the northwest and western coast of South America, those are areas where the climate is changing relative to the biota in a way that is 
considered a novel or a disappearing climate biologically. So that's where I go. That is overlain and kind of combined with the problem that you well know, which is rapid development in these regions. We know about the Arab Spring, but really we're having a Latin American decade or century where uh, absolutely the engine of development is at radical the speeds and, and the pistons are firing very, very strongly in Colombia and Peru and Ecuador and in Brazil in particular. Um, that's where a lot of my attention goes because it's an area where uh, scientists have a big role to play in improving or at least uh, helping that process along. It's going to happen no matter what. Here's an expression of that in terms of climate. That uh, map is tough to see. The red shows an area in Colombia that had underwent so much flooding under a uh, very interesting climate anomaly in 2010. This is the same flooding that closed the Panama Canal for the first time in its history. And that flooding, my point here is that climate and land use are interactive and integrated now on the land surface in spatially explicit ways that ecologists and earth scientists need to deal with. It's not uniform across the surface. The effect of a drought or a precipitation, a major uh, uh, flood in this case, is very spatially explicit. At the same time, in the same months, we had an extreme drought in the south part of the Amazon basin. Reds show uh, precipitation anomalies from the NASA TRIM spacecraft, uh, an extreme drought event simultaneously happening on the South American continent stretched over a period really of about a year. That's the kind of climate and land use change um, interaction that I'm talking about. And it's the kind of stuff that really individuals and small departments of, in specialized fields just can't really approach. It takes interdisciplinary and, and uh, cross-agency types of activities like you guys invest in at Ceres and that we try to invest in, in on a smaller scale at Carnegie. This is a map that shows kind of a, a, a kind of a titrated viewpoint for uh, policymakers, where we expect the climate is shifting and will be shifting the most. Uh, yellows are higher rates and degrees of climate change relative to the biota, and dark green is less change. Yet the reds and the oranges are land use change and the complete restructuring of the actual land surface by way of this economic boom that's going on. So what I talk to and what I do at Carnegie is I take what I learned at Ceres I combine that with what I'm learning as a Carnegie scientist working internationally with policymakers, especially with federal governments in Latin America. And we try to talk to them about how to not only know about what's going on, but to actually utilize the latest science and technology in a way that will really allow them to do a better geographically oriented management plan for their countries. One of the things I talk to them about is forests and being an ecologist with a degree from EPO, is it called EPOB anymore? I don't even think so. A biology degree from the University of Colorado. I, I, very, uh, I, I can speak on forests probably the best, and I talk to people about the role they play in carbon storage and its role in climate mitigation. I talk to them about filtering water, like the Catskills uh, example that everybody uses uh, from New York. I also talk a, a fair bit about flood control and about using latent heat as a way to mitigate drought-imposed fire. These are pretty technical terms and, and ideas for, for non-scientists, but getting it down, reducing it, engaging, takes your science and your, your, your delivery, and, and that's something I definitely learned here at Ceres. I also do bring in the biology side. I, I'm wondering if everybody here would even agree with me but that biodiversity plays a key role in regulating these processes. It used to be that geologists thought that the green slime was just in the way of the geology, and then they, okay, we'll keep the slime because maybe it has some carbon storage potential. But I say that the colors, the kaleidoscope of the biology is actually really central to maintaining it. And I'll, t I'll mention that a little later. Forest of sponges. Here's a simple idea that some of us as scientists don't totally agree on. Are they really sponges? What does that mean? But policymakers understand that forests can act as sponges helping to mitigate, for example, flooding. And there are basic processes that we understand uh, we don't understand them geographically yet, and that's a key issue that we have to deal with uh, scientifically and technologically. But we understand their magnitude and their general importance in terms of, say, rainfall and evaporation, transpiration and infiltration. Again, we know that different types of forests provide that water uh, resource regulation in different ways. Faster growing forests actually are pretty wasteful water users. 
but they can provide a short-term investment in getting your water, uh, your water resource under control. And slow growers or primary forests tend to be really good long-term sponges that provide a kind of a, a mediating force for the hydrological cycle in a region in the, in the face or the, in the context of the climate changes that are very much ongoing in South America right now. Forests can become uh, a problem if they are disturbed and opened up and they become droughty. They tend to get fire and they do things that we don't see in the, in the pollen record. Uh, we see that in the Amazon now where huge amounts of fire, not just associated with clearing but with escaped fire into areas that are forested still. You would fly over with MODIS or Landsat instruments, see that it's still green, but they burn because they're disturbed. It's a complex, complex problem in South America. One of those policy instruments that you might be aware of is called RED. I have a major uh, focus on RED. That's uh, the UN and other programs are promoting reduced emissions from deforestation and forest degradation. And it's one of those, you know, hopeful uh, goals that's it's still ongoing where the UN Framework Convention on Climate Change has been awfully slow over the last decade. Some people, including me, say mostly failing now. But then there are some really innovative jurisdictional red programs that are now in place in the state of California, started by, by Governor Schwarzenegger and continued by Governor Brown. Is we, in 2013, we begin the process of cap and trade development with uh, 11 other jurisdictions, states and provinces around the, country, around the globe that represent about 25% of all tropical forests on the planet. So while UN style development in red has been slow, the jurisdiction cap and trade ideas have, have moved along very fast. And that's where the science from Carnegie and, and, and others uh, is putting, putting a lot of emphasis. So the challenge to policymakers and decision makers and people who are going to even consider using science in a more high-tech manner, the way that Ceres produces and the way that I learned to produce at Carnegie, is that we need to create a self-regulating style of natural forest infrastructure. Why are we pitting one against the other? They ought to be integrated in, a, in an honest, clear, and innovative management plan that's geographic. Um, I, we also talk a lot about optimizing the forest resources in, in the face of infrastructural space needs so that there are, so that the, the argument is almost uh, diffused before the, the, the stakeholders come to the table where there's a certain amount of forest that actually works to protect infrastructure and non-forest land development and, and vice versa. That, producing that kind of knowledge is very, very complex, especially with governments. It requires technology. It doesn't only rely on it, but it, it's a foundation is to have a system that can uh, that, that can ingest information, and we all know about these types of diagrams that you combine climate data and geospatial data and modeling and you produce decision support. That's very hard to do. We're still not that good at it, especially in developing countries. What, what is getting clearer to leaders in these countries is that you're not gonna even attempt to build that without spatially explicit high-tech data. And that's where uh, a lot of my training uh, starts to play a role. In that context at Carnegie, we developed two lines of activity. One is satellite-based and one is aircraft-based. The satellite-based is very mature now. It's called Class Light. It's a system, software and, and people type system for monitoring forests and how they're changing in terms of degradation and deforestation. I'll talk about that in a minute. And then the Airborne Observatory that we built at Carnegie. Again, this is a 12-person project, not a hundreds of people project, but you'll get an idea of what it's able to produce that policymakers are able to utilize and understand almost right out of the gate. So Class Light is the satellite system. To not go into it too deeply, but to mention it because we're proud of our work as a very small team working with governments, it's a system that automatically analyzes data from nine satellites and produces forced cover change maps for these governments. More importantly, it's, it's a system that they have been taught to use so deeply that we now have nearly 300 agencies using it, and we are just the tech support now, running around mostly fixing problems in the background, and there's a pie chart showing the kind of breakdown that we're able to, to produce in terms of the user community for this satellite mapping system, a key ingredient to this spatial problem of land use and climate change. Here are examples of kind of our super users. We have federal governments who for the first time in their history are mapping their changes in forest cover. 
This was not possible five years ago. Scientists in the North were producing maps like this, and those inherently are not accepted into the process in these countries. That's uh, an example on the left of seven years of forest change in Colombia, and a brand new one from the Peruvian government, from a Ministry of Environment that was founded in 2008. By the way, they were founded because they were forced to do it by USAID in order to sign the Peru-US Free Trade Agreement. And it's not for them alone. What, where Class Light is, where that monitoring program is, where I have taken it in order to get it outside of the ivory tower, is we have worked deeply with Google. And later this year, it will be launched on the Google Earth engine. And everybody will be able to make maps of what's going on in the tropics and, and globally. The Airborne Observatory, I developed really a lot of the ideas here developed out of working with Carol and working with people in Boulder in general uh, that you know, still currently satellites cannot measure biomass and biodiversity and these other key ingredients. We know where the forests are, but we don't know their properties with enough detail to predict or manage their role in mitigating climate change or managing the land. So the Airborne Observatory is, it's not a high-tech uh, jet aircraft because we actually want to fly it far and slow. It does have a global range in terms of our operations. We operate on um, all forested continents. And uh, a virtual tour looks something like this. A very high-tech sensor package in the back I'll talk about. A uh, computing facility in the center and a people space where students, postdocs, and some of my very best technicians operate the aircraft in terms of navigation and data collection and also training foreign government uh, partners. We also don't have enough money to have a pressurized aircraft, so we're, so we're fl flying around with oxygen masks and, and bottles and, and porta potties. But it's a spirited uh, activity involving a lot of people, including our, our number one subcontractor the, is the Jet Propulsion Laboratory in the upper right, and really some of the most spiritual types of environmental thinkers. And the bottom right is Jim Cameron, who I've been working with to try to translate what I'm about to show you to the public through uh, not the Avatar series that he's producing now, but through other projects that the Avatar Foundation is involved in. To pause for a moment on the instrumentation, it's absolutely the most advanced instrumentation for ecosystem research flying. And I can say that because we helped write the documentation for NEON to produce exact copies of this. So um, we're, we're proud that it's moving outward into the um, outside of Carnegie's walls. In the front is the, uh, our premier sensing system that's built at the Jet Propulsion Lab. It's a very, very high fidelity imaging spectrometer, 400 plus channels, 5,000 signal to one on a 5% five, five, uh, target, for example, in the, in the visible. We can talk about that uh, at the break. A very high-end waveform dual laser LIDAR system, light detection and ranging, it allows us, as you'll see, to see, in, see ecosystems in detail in ways that were not possible ever before. And a zoom spectrometer that lets us see less of the spectrum, but in very high spatial resolution. Oops. Oh dear. There we go. Those measurements are, what are one of our key things at Carnegie is not using those measurements uh, individually, but fully integrated measurements. We think of it as a single measurement that allows a, uh, an image of forest in, in detail like never before. These forests uh, you would fly over would look just green. We see them in terms of their structure, biomass, chemistry, which I learned mostly from Carol, and their biodiversity. And what we've learned in the tropics is that a lot of the chemistry and structural information leads to biodiversity information, as you see here. These colors are different species. There's another, there's another view uh, just of some small spot I know of in southern Peru. The standard 3D imagery that you can get from LIDAR, but colored, so to speak, by the imaging spectrometer, and then uh, analyzed to biomass levels in extremely high spatial resolution and chemical and functional properties processes and properties. Another example, just for quick uh, calibrate of your mind, is uh, 3D structure of forests and allowing us to see uh, not only where the biomass is, but actually differential rates of growth and mortality based on their chemical signatures. The, the redder trees are actually growing, sucking up carbon faster than the bluer trees. One of the holy grails in this project and this process has been trying to get beyond this aerial photography type measurements which are very useful, but policymakers don't know what to do with them. And that led to the spectronomics program at Carnegie where we spent 
a huge amount of research time and dollars trying to convert these uh, imagery, images with these uh, very high-end spectrometers into this, where you see real functional and chemical detail that isn't a cartoon, these are data, and, um, and express the, not just the functional diversity of the forest, how is it able to function as that uh, hydrological sponge, is it, is it a portfolio of species that are persisting, or is it one that isn't so uh, highly diverse? There's an example. One that's highly diverse versus one that is a single plantation species, just for example. And then, and then to, to take it beyond that and to be able to go into forests from the air, where, you know, you can map, I just came back from Peru, we ma just mapped 100 million acres. Uh, and the, we're mapping in detail where the detail expresses to policymakers what they have. And that detail can be chemical, it can be structural, it can just be inspiring so that they engage. And integrating that information back with the satellite data and teaching it and making it uh, clear that the future for them is now and that if they're going to have this industrial revolution, they ought to have a technology re revolution to go along with it. Where they can now produce, and this is them doing the work, producing maps of 3D forest structure and changes in terms of uh, deforestation and and other processes on the ground, converting that information to biomass in this case so that they can play a role, a direct role in negotiations on carbon and red. This is just a graph showing how tight the correlation can be between the, the airborne data and the actual conditions on the ground in terms of biomass. And producing the first maps of forest carbon stocks, that's what the colors are, low is red and high is green, in a way that's spatially explicit, that's detailed, that it means something to them subnationally and nationally. This is an area that's four times the size of Denmark, eight times the size of all of Costa Rica's forests. This is a huge area in Colombian Amazon. You see the strength of the sponge, of this hydrological sponge. Areas that flooded are, when they had the big flooding event, are in the red area. And that's happened to be areas that have low carbon, a low capacity to absorb and release that water in a sponge-like way. Panama is my last example. I've been working heavily in Panama with the government. I don't know if you noticed, I mentioned it earlier, that the Panama Canal was closed for the first time in its history in 2010. And we, we now understand it's because the hydrological sponge has been cut off to most of the, the canal. This is, let me just go back. Uh, it's not going to let me. Yeah, this is the first ever high uh, resolution map of the carbon stocks and thus the hydrological sponge of Panama. Red is high, good forest cover, uh, an ability to um, uh, deal with these climate events inherently because of its forest structure is intact, versus the blue areas that uh, were extremely flooded out and eroded. And in the, like I said, in the Panama Canal shown here, they've maintained forest cover just along the canal zone, but they had a huge amount of flooding that came in right through those forests and actually took out a lot of the forest during the process. So they have a, a serious infrastructure problem that tells them they've got to put forest back as fast as they can, and we're working with them in that context. That's where the science has a direct impact, not only on policy, but on commerce. I think I heard that 3% of all of uh, transportation goes through the Panama Canal globally. And finally, biodiversity. Why does it matter? Well, a system like this, the northern Peru that underwent the big drought in 2010, that's what the lower graph reminds me of, reminds me to say. But this northern big region, this is a 100 million acres we just mapped. The system is inherently evolved to actually have a differential style response to climate events because of the biodiversity. This is the first map of different plant communities. And what you see is that in the mountains, in the Andes, that's an engine for speciation. That's where species are made. And those, those systems are extremely important to maintain, not only for the future of biodiversity, but in terms of the response of the system to any kind of climate perturbation, you need to understand that the system is not the same everywhere, and you must plan for it accordingly. Finally, this has, this has been the kind of stuff that I learned here. This is the kind of stuff that gets presidents on board the plane, that gets ministers, ministers of environment inv invested and involved in this. And it's the, these types of activities that I think are the future for uh, the process of, of development in Latin America. My last slide is here. It basically are just a few points that says, in the future, as we go forward, the science that we learn here and that we utilize here at Ceres and at Carnegie is one that really doesn't need to pit infrastructure against forests anymore. That's just an old way of thinking that needs to die, I think. I think really it's a matter of working them together in a way that, um, that 
uh, sustains both uh, the human habitat and the natural habitat and makes them one habitat. Investing in these regional hydroecological type uh, thinking and forecasting systems is the way of the future in Latin America. Without them, with the rates of climate change they're seeing, that you don't have to tell President Santos of Colombia that he has a climate change problem. He's telling us he does. They need a spatially explicit system for doing that. The, the, the types of measurements that only we were once able to make, now they need to make, and we need to make them with them. We need to make them w alongside them, but also they need to take it on the, the task themselves. So we have to teach that, and we have, to, um, we have to promote that outside of our own institutional walls. And then show them that there's a way to manage these systems that are, is done in a high-tech manner that allows them to make changes based on, we had a flood last year, we need to invest in forests in this sector, to try, uh, geographic sector, to try to mitigate against floods of the future, or we had a drought such and such a year, and we, the fires took out a big part of the infrastructure, and people were displaced, and therefore we're gonna spatially manage it that way, you know, based on the, the, the inclusion of the biota in the process. I just wanna say that, unlike you guys, I'm almost not federally funded. Uh, a lot of this stuff is, is stuff that's happening outside of U.S. borders, so it's mostly foundation money, but uh, I did learn how to fundraise while I was here. That's the, the, the last big thing I learned. Thank you very much. Thank mm -hmm. you.